Well, guys, today is another installment of the Skill Trade Rescue podcast. And today I have Damon Martin uh, on the podcast. Super excited to have Damon here. He is the actual working technician in the field. And as we've been trying to do, part of this series is to kind of get the word out as to what's going on in skilled trades and maybe share some uh, things, some mindsets, some habits, uh, hear about what folks like Damon are doing to be successful. And I'm hoping to inspire those of you who maybe not be destined to go to college or maybe have gone to college and looking for something more hands-on. So I'm trying to serve the market out there and uh, hear from real people rather than me sitting here and prognosticating about how great skilled trades are. So, Damon, welcome to the show today, man. Thank you. Hey, that's awesome. So you are, uh, g give us a kind of a little bio on you know, the company you're with and what you're doing and uh, how long you've been in the skilled trades and just uh, share, share with the audience a little bit about your history. Okay. Well, I've been uh, doing heating and air conditioning for give or take 22 years now. Um, I got started actually in the military, uh, served in the Marine Corps. My MOS was 1161, which was basic refrigeration mechanic. Okay. Uh, it basically instilled uh, a desire to succeed, a desire to move. Uh, it's my, my military time is the reason why uh, I have the demeanor that I have, where, where my job is concerned. Uh, now, where my job is concerned, I work for a company named Store Services out of Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, I work remotely out of, uh, well, basically from my house in uh, Brownsboro, Texas. Uh, I've been with Store for 13 years and some months. Uh, what else? Uh, I do. I do the everything from chiller work, bowlers, air handlers, uh, VAS systems. I also do building automation and controls. Uh, my current status at the company is a field VAS technician uh, on the senior level. Uh, I found in my career that if you have the mindset of I'm going to go into heating and air conditioning and I'm just going to work, say, residential, or I'm just going to uh, specialize in one aspect of the trade, you're not going to get very far. The, uh, at least with the heating and air trade, and I'm sure it applies to other trades, but if you have the mindset of limiting yourself, you're going to limit yourself in more than one way. So that, that's uh, my, my deal, you know, once again, being military, being Marine Corps, I also served in the Navy, served in two different branches, but being in the Marine Corps really instilled a, a desire to be the best at what I do. doesn't matter what I'm doing, right. I'm going to be the best at it. Uh, I have worked as an electrician, I've worked as a plumber, I've worked in obviously the heating and air trade. Um, I've worked as a carpenter in my life, uh, but this is where I belong. Mm -hmm. So just for you folks out there that uh, don't know what BAS stands for, that's building automation systems. And uh, so uh, tell us about that, because uh, I think you're probably the first uh, building automation specialist that we've had on. What, what is that particular, ta what's that scope all about? Uh, so as a BAS technician, after the installs, uh, you're the one that comes in when customers having problems, you diagnose using various tools to include a laptop, uh, various software packages. Uh, once again, you got to be open. You can't say, I want to specialize in one brand. You know, you need to be open to be able to work on multiple brands because you have multiple customers right. with multiple needs. Uh, I'll show up on a site, check in with my site contact. Uh, he'll take me to the piece of equipment not functioning correctly. I'll plug in, make a connection to the local controller. I may get on their front end. Uh, it just depends on what the problem is. And I've been doing it so long that I can generally right off the bat know where I need to be. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then I go through programming. I go through points. I look for false alarms. And then, because I also have the mechanical background, then I turn to and start diagnosing the actual, say, air handler or the actual chiller. Right. Uh, but it, it, that's, that's a generalized scope of what I do. Um, right now, 98% of my work is with one of our largest clients. Uh, and I'm pretty much here all the time at this point. Because um, they, they just, it's a big, big building with a whole lot of moving parts. And they need somebody that can help their maintenance people keep everything running smoothly. Right. Yeah, so, you know, that's really interesting because this this is a key thing that I want guys to know out there is back back in the day, very few pieces of equipment were uh, processed or controlled, controlled by basically many computers. And over the last, I don't know, what do you say, Damon, decade or so, we're seeing the proliferation of, of processor control in all kinds of aspects of the of the trades in general, but especially in the HVAC business. Exactly. Um, you know, now we're, we're, we've got technology right now that would blow your mind. Right. I'm, a, I'm able to turn on and off water fountains for customers if they want. Right, right. So you're working, so you work for a, a uh, service contractor, but your assignment is one particular customer. So you're sort of like an extension of that, of your customer's facilities department, right? I wouldn't say that um, because I do still work for multiple customers, okay. multiple different locations. It's just that this particular customer needs me the most Okay. right now. They're going through a transition and I'm here to help them through that. Right. Hey guys, quick announcement. If you have not stopped into our website at skilltraderescue.com, please do that. On the home page here, you will see that we have the Join the Movement email list. If you haven't signed up, please consider doing that. We have some amazing guests lined up for the podcast. I'm going to be getting the stories out of successful technicians and business owners in skilled trades. These are not just HVAC people. These are going to be people from across the skilled trade spectrum. And my hope is that I'm going to be able to draw out of these people the things that have worked in their careers amazingly well and the things that if they had a chance to talk to their younger self, what they would tell them not to do. So I want to share all that stuff with you. And if you sign up, you're going to be the first to know when we drop those new podcast episodes. Also, coming soon, we have the BEST workshop. It's a five-day automated email workshop. However, you're going to give content to us through that workshop. You're going to get one-on-one -on -one feedback from our instructors, instructors, and we're looking to better your career. Uh, I've been teaching the BEST process for many, many years, about two decades one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm going to be trying to do that uh, to the masses through this workshop. It's totally free. All you got to do is sign up, and as soon as you do that, you'll get alerts on your email as soon as these new podcasts come in as well as the BEST workshop. So if you check it out, I will put a link to the website on the show notes for this episode today. So check it out. Okay. And that, you know, that's another thing too, is that if you, if you get, obviously you're there at that particular customer, you're, it sounds like you're their primary guy, right? From your company yes, at that. Yeah. And that's actually a, a key thing because if, if key customers for the contractor that you're working with, get the idea that you really know what you're doing um, you could get assigned projects like that so you get it you know you, you develop a relationship with this customer at a much higher level than a typical technician right oh yes yes yeah, yeah my relationship awesome. with this particular customer is very strong right and he believe he believes in me I he's never questioned me except for when we first met and started working together Right. You know, he had questions. Now, if I tell him, he's just like, go with it, you know, right. let's get it fixed. That's a, that's a great place to be, man. <laughs> it really is. Well, cool. So tell me about uh, one of your biggest success stories, like something that really, uh, that you're really proud of that has occurred or 
that you've done as part of your uh, your HVAC skilled trades journey? Uh, Something that pops ooh. to mind. Yeah, um, about seven years ago, I was sent to uh, southern Louisiana to do an overhaul on a 1982 model uh, train CBHB chiller, Whoa. Uh, also known as a two-wheeler. Right. Um, I had never even seen one, never performed a maintenance on one. But I was, at that point in time, the only one qualified to do that. Do that. Uh -huh. uh, we had a big, you know, thing, and uh, the guy who was supposed to do it took vacation, so it, they, they sent me. Uh, I get down there, my boss shows up to uh, give me a quick, you know, quick rundown of how this machine works. Keeping in mind, it hadn't even been upgraded to DDC controls. It was still yeah. running Maddox. Yep. Uh, so it was all new to me. Um, at the end of the day, I completed the overhaul. Uh, the customer said the chiller had never run that smooth. And now they look at us for, they've got two more of them, and they don't want to change them out. These chillers are on the 22nd story of this building, so wow. they don't want to do a change out. Uh, they want to keep the ones they have running, and they trust us to keep them running. That that must have made you feel good, man. It did. It did. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Now, what, what what do you declare an overhaul? Is that did you tear down the compressors and and just completely go through this thing? What what roughly what was the scope of this overhaul that you did? Uh, this particular one actually had a wider scope than what our normal overhaul process was at the yeah. time. Right. Um, so we did, uh, we opened both the evaporator and condenser barrels, uh, cleaned the tubes, got eddy current out there to do eddy current testing. Uh, we did tear down both stages of the compressor. We took it down all the way from the evaporator to the condenser. Mm -hmm. Every, the whole compressor assembly come apart. Uh, we ended up having to chain, replace some gaskets inside of the actual motor mm -hmm. as part of this overhaul. Uh, and then the rebuild, uh, clean everything up, you know, immaculate, uh, you know, like painters say, half the work is in the prep or three quarters of your work is in the prep. Yeah. So w we spent a few days just cleaning flanges, getting everything ready to go back together. Uh, we broke 23 bolts, taking it apart. So they, those all had to be drilled and retapped. Ooh. Yeah, it was, it was it, the machine hadn't been overhauled since 1993, and I think this was 2016 when wow. I. You, so you could still find parts for those things, huh? Yes, yes, oh, it's wow. a yeah. pretty standard gasket sets. Uh, well, I don't, you know, there are differences, but train keeps that old stuff because they know yeah. they still have the chillers out in the field. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Now, what were they using this chiller for, Damon? Was it uh, was it comfort oh, cooling? Yeah. Okay. Oh, are you doing much stuff with process chillers, or is it mostly uh, nowadays? Are you doing much with process, or is it mostly I, uh, comfort comfort stuff? I, well, mostly comfort stuff nowadays. But I just moved to Texas three years ago, and mm -hmm. prior to that, I lived in Louisiana, and one of my main customers there was actually up in Arkansas, mm -hmm. and he had process cooling. Uh -huh. uh, they they made uh, aerospace foams. Oh wow! Okay. So they were running. Uh, their loop temperature was negative eleven Celsius. Wow! So I had to, you know, it was my task to keep that machine running because they did not have a backup. Right. Right. Wow. So what what kind of habits? I kind of touched on this in the opening, Damon. What what kind of habits? Speaking to the the new technicians out there, do you find most important? And I and I understand the one getting work getting to work on time and you know that kind of stuff. But putting that aside for a minute, you know what what's the secret sauce to uh, becoming successful uh, in in your you know in skilled trades in general? Like what, what's your what's your key things uh, that you have found that have served you well and, and have really contributed to your advancement in your career? What, what types of things are that? Uh, one thing would be um, just keeping an open mind. Don't, don't ever say, I only want to do this. 
Right. You want to know everything about your trade. Right. You, you, uh, you have to be open to moving from department to department as needed by your company, of course, and in some cases begging for it. Mm -hmm. I want to learn this. I got to learn that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. That, that mentality will get, get you far. I, I trained many a young guy or young in the trade, I should say. I've got one with me today that I'm, I'm training. Okay. Uh, they, these two guys really impress me. They're, they're never late, and I hate harping on that because that's like real low on my priority list. Mm -hmm. But never late, they always asking me questions. I can't stand working with a, a new guy and him not asking me not one question about right. what we're doing or why. Because that, that just shows me he doesn't really want to learn it. Right. And right. you know, at that point you start wondering if you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. So these guys are constantly asking me questions, which constantly has me thinking, uh, and even kind of double guessing myself from time to time. So <laughs> that a lot of it is mentality. You know, right. you gotta have the right mentality. Hey guys, I have an exciting announcement. We just recently made some updates to our three most popular online courses at processchilleracademy.com. If you're a technician that's looking to improve your skills a little bit, maybe get some specialized training to be of more value to your customers and your employer, or if you are an employer, a contractor that is looking to augment your existing in-house training with online training that can be accessible from any device, this is a really great opportunity. Just go to processchilleracademy.com, just scroll down on the home page and you will see the course area. If you go into the course page, you will see that we are currently for a limited time, we have a promo code of Chiller Pro that will save you 25% on e any one of these courses. So I hope you check it out and I'm looking forward to seeing you in class. That, that, that would be my biggest one. Uh, yeah. Be open. Are you training a lot of guys these days? So you say you're training two now. Uh, is, is that something that your boss is, is uh, leaning on you to, to bring up these, these new guys? They, they uh, not, not really. Um, it's just that this job that I'm on, there's so much to it that I couldn't do it by myself. Right. They had to send uh, help. And when they do that, they want to send like the apprentices or the junior technicians to be help for a senior. They're not going to send two senior guys on one job. That's right. that's a waste of time. But uh, in the process, I take it upon myself right. to pass on my knowledge to them. That's so good, Damon. That is, you know, and you know what's really interesting. You touched on this. Whenever you get in a situation, I found this when when you have to. You have people just hammering you with questions, which is very motivational for, especially mm -hmm. if you like, if you have a, a heart of a teacher, which it seems like you do, it, it makes you smarter, right? Because you have to explain things um, in, and by verbalizing things that you already know and having to share with these guys, it, it keeps you sharp. Have you noticed that? Yes. Yeah. yeah I taught yeah. myself a bunch just by explaining through a process, right. and I've, I've, I've learned that uh, my best teaching style mm -hmm. is to, when I'm working on a chiller and it's like a one-man thing, I'm sitting there constantly talking to myself so he hears me. Right, and oh, that's, good. that's a good talking idea. myself through the process. Right. With, he's picking up on this. Yeah. And then for the next chiller, and I kind of step back and see if he'll take control. And, you know, everyone I've trained so far will step in there and take control yeah. until they get to the point where they're telling me, no, you're not doing this. You need to just be here to make sure we don't make a boo-boo. Right, right. Yeah, you know, one of the things that maybe you run into this, but when, when you're, you know, at the top of your game, if you will, and I, I have a feeling that's kind of about where you are. We're always learning stuff, but when you're you're, you know, pretty competent in what you do. You, you've got, you're competent and confident in what you're doing. Um, there's two types of apprentice technicians. The, I used to call them the Klingons. You know, you'd have the ones that they ran into a problem, so they immediately get on the phone with you. 
and you quickly turn into kind of like a crutch. Yeah. Um, I, I used to have that happen all the time, and I finally wised up. I finally wised up, and I would start a answering questions with questions. You know, I would say something like, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> and, then just, and then just shut up and see what they say. And after a while, they get the message, right? Right. <laughs> and then you have the guys that, that they're – you have the guys that will only ask a question if they truly don't know, right? And that that's a different different animal altogether. Or the ones that just won't ask questions because they're afraid to that you think badly of them about them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You really you really have to play to the crowd, man. You know when you're teaching guys, uh, it's uh, that's awesome. So what's the labor market like out there in Texas now? So um, you know now that the pandemic is is winding down or whatever it is. Um, did you guys see uh, any any slowdown through the pandemic as far as job opportunities and stuff, or did it stay pretty? You guys are essential workers, and you guys got your hours in. Yeah, it, it pretty much stayed pretty level. But then after afterwards, uh, you know, after that initial big scare that everybody was going to die, right. uh, it the the at least for our trade, the workload was huge. Right. We we actually had to go on a hiring spree to get yeah. more people. Yeah. Because uh, they did go, you know, some odd months without calling us, or not calling us, but without doing the uh, the essential maintenances. They would call if they had something go down. Right. Uh, but you know they most of our customers have stuff breaking on a daily basis right and that, it's unfortunate but you know it keeps us busy mm -hmm. yeah that's that's what i'm hearing nationally damon is that uh uh everybody stayed busy because in general in the trades doesn't matter what trade it is any skilled trade especially if you're you know at the top of your game um everybody remained busy throughout the pandemic and mm -hmm. then once once the pandemic started to subside, you're right. There was a lot of um, deferred maintenance stuff that you know because well, there just wasn't enough people in the buildings, right? So you know they as soon as things started getting back to normal again, the workload just skyrocketed. So you know everybody that I know is super super busy right now, and they just can't get enough hands to you know to man the ship, right? <laughs> well, I mean I know I know our we get an applied labor report. We get to see it every month. Uh, breaks it down by area and by technician. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't remember what mine was the last time I saw it, but this thing includes when you take PTO time that goes against unapplied labor right. hours. Right. But I'm still staying in the 90 percentile area of applied time. Wow. So it, let's say you get somebody who's uh, you know decided to go into the trades. And, you know, maybe they go and get a, a certificate course or, you know, they, they get some basic education about refrigeration. Um, are they going to get snapped up pretty quickly? It's, I mean, is there high likelihood that that person's going to get employed? Oh, yes. Yes, for sure. Okay. Well, we're always hiring. We never, right. we, in 13 years I've worked here, we've gone on one hiring freeze and it didn't last but a couple of months. Yeah, yeah. And what, what, if you don't mind me asking in Texas, so in general, you know, what, what are uh, apprentice technicians, first year guys and women, uh, what, what are they starting out at now, roughly in Texas? Depending on who you go to work for and what aspect of the trade, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be commercial, industrial, residential. Mm -hmm. uh, my company is commercial indust and industrial. Mm -hmm. uh, the apprentices, if I'm not mistaken, start around 15 an hour. Okay. That's that's the guy that just graduated school. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then they come to work for us, and we put them through a five-year school. Okay. That's uh, It's five years of NC, NCCER mm -hmm. training. Right. So then they get that on top of their trade school certifications. Are you guys union? No. You're, you're not union. Okay. 
So what what happens? Let's say they get their five years in. Uh, what what's the? And I, you don't need to be specific to your company. Just in general, what, what what's a journeyman in uh, in Texas down there making now? Oh, journeyman, not that I couldn't tell you. I mean, I, I wouldn't even be in the ballpark. Okay. That, I, I, I never went through a journeyman's program myself. Mm -hmm. I literally have a Department of Defense uh, uh, EPA card. Well, let's just say what's top wage, I guess would be a better way to ask that. What, what's, a, what's a top wage for a senior HVAC commercial tech in Texas? Probably in the 40s. Okay. And then you got benefits on top of that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, one of the things I've been... I've been hammering on for months, actually years now, is all of the media, the, you know, the media, skilled trades is a, is a dirty, smelly thing that, you know, you only do when nothing else works out, right? I mean, that, that's the way it's being spun. And everybody quotes the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, the, the, that's, that's like the gold standard on what skilled trades makes, right? And, it's nowhere close to accurate, just right. nowhere close to it. You know, so I, I haven't looked, but I'll bet you if I looked up your market in on the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics sites and put in journeyman HVAC technician, it would probably say something in the 20 to $30 range, which is just nuts. It just doesn't exist, you know, but. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, somebody who's been doing it this long, and uh, has made it uh, his life's goal to learn every aspect of the trade. Mm -hmm. If all you're getting offered is in the 20s and 30s, um, you're doing something wrong in your interview. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, very cool. So, what what do you what do you think that we need to do as an industry to attract new talent because you know you're looking at me i'm an old you know gray-haired dude and you know mine's not exactly brown anymore <laughs> yeah so you know we're getting old right and, yep. and you know i i'm out here in the northwest but i have these conversations all the time you know that you you look at the typical hvac well actually skilled trade truck electricians plumbers doesn't matter you you, you know you're at a stoplight and you look you look in at that van next to you with the ladders on it chances are pretty good you're going to see somebody with a little more salt than pepper <laughs> right you know so so what what, do, what can we do collectively as you know the the exiting crew to to help you know attract more men and women to skilled trades in general i mean have you, have you put your head around that at all uh, well, I think for one thing is we need to get rid of the persona that this is, you know, dirty, nasty, extremely hard work. Right. And it may have been back in the 80s. And in the 90s, when I first got into it, no, it, it still it wasn't at that point. Uh, and now, I mean, we have, once again, we have stupid technology. We got We got stuff that one man can lift a 6,000 pound compressor motor and move it. Right. Uh, now, due to safety purposes, you would never do that. You would always have a safe man. So right. I think, you know, put that out there. But, uh, uh, you know, it is, it, it's not like it used to be. Yeah, you get dirty, you get greasy. Uh, you have soap, you have water. So we gotta get, we gotta get rid of the idea that it's just hard, grueling work with no pay. Mm -hmm. And no, no uh, thanks. The, these yeah. career fields probably get the most thanks and uh, pats on the back than any other kind of industry. Yeah. You know, it's just they, they, like my bosses. I mean, I got out and drove in the snow to go take care of a customer. <laughs> Keeping in mind, it don't snow in Texas very often, so people here don't know how to drive on it. But <laughs> I, I went and took care of the customer, and they give me a, a exceed the need award for it. Right. Um, so we, yeah, we, I guess uh, more more of the advertising. You you always see lawyer offices and 
doctor's uh, offices and whatever on billboards, but you never see uh, Joe Schmo's electrical or, you know, Martin's heating and air. You, right. you, don't, you don't see that so much. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, you're right. Well, it's a college program, because down here, a lot of people are actually getting associate's degrees in heating and air conditioning technology. Through so the community colleges? Yes. Okay. The community colleges. Uh, and, you know, it, bringing, bringing that up as well, me personally, I have two college degrees. I have an associate's in IT and a bachelor's in business. Wow. So, but you see what I'm doing for my living. Yeah, that's interesting. So did you do that right out of the military? You use your GI Bill to, to go back to college? I, I waited uh, six years. I got I got injured in 03 and got sent home. And uh, I waited until 2009 just to make sure I had the right mindset to devote to college. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I started. And mm -hmm. three, three years later, I graduated with my bachelor's. That's so fascinating. So, so I want to hear about that. So you, you have a degree, a college degree. Uh, obviously, you hit a crossroads somewhere. What what made you uh, go into the trades versus? Well, I'm sure you can apply some of your uh, your college to what you're doing now. But what what made you go into the trades versus uh, you know like a white collar thing that you could have done with that degree? Well, I was I was working. I was actually working for my current company. Uh, before I even began college. Oh, okay. uh, I started the store in January of 09, and I started school in uh, uh, towards the end of 09. Mm -hmm. So I was already working here, and I had already built a respect for the owner, who's uh, since passed away. Uh, he greatly missed man. Mm -hmm. Very respectable person. But uh, I had grown a certain level of respect for him, and his son was the uh, VP of the company. At all the upper management, uh, I had gotten such a huge amount of respect for them that I had already made up my mind it didn't matter if I graduated or not. Mm -hmm. From college, I was going to stay at store. Right. And if I decided to use my education for their benefit, then good to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I would do it, but I would still be in the trades. Right. That's fascinating. Like people just don't impress me. Yeah. They, they want me to be too clean and shaven and stuff. <laughs> that's fascinating because, you know, that that's that's sort of a theme that a lot. I've, I've done a couple of podcast interviews with military guys, and I and that's just a fascinating question to hear the answer to because I've had several guys that, you know, like you, was in the military, and they get out, and some have injuries, some don't, but they – they serve their country and then they they're at a crossroads they are going, OK, so I can, you know, I can go in, use my GI Bill and get, you know, get a college education. Um, so and they're typically they can get through that with their GI Bill without a ton of debt. So that's good. But it's it's surprising to me that, you know, a, a lot of guys out of the military are choosing to go into the trades for various reasons. You know, some went to work for family businesses, some just didn't want to be a suit and tie it's sitting in a cubicle somewhere you know it's it's so interesting to you know to hear that <laughs> and a lot of us getting out of the service though we're used to the the more grueling environments right, right. and uh, workloads right. so you know my mos was refrigeration mechanic but when i deployed i actually deployed as a uh, uh logistics mm -hmm. Uh, NCO. Mm -hmm. So I was working outside of my MOS. So, you know, that, that brings back to the keeping an open mind to learn new things. Right. I was right. working in a logistics shop with the MOS of refrigeration, learning about logistics, preparing all the gear to ship to Kuwait, mm -hmm. and then preparing the gear that came back when I did, preparing it to come back. Mm -hmm. So open mind gets you so far in multiple aspects of life it's not just your career right it, you know your personal life yeah no that that's that's 
that's a life lesson right there, man. That really is. Wow. So hey, we've been uh, we've been on this about a little over a half hour now. How did that go by quick? <laughs> yeah, it did. I wasn't even watching the time. Yeah. Hey, so um, I it's totally okay if you don't want to, but um, do you? If we have a newbie, somebody out there that's thinking about getting in skilled trades, wants to send you a, a quick email, uh, would it be okay for uh, just to, uh, do you have an email you're okay with sharing with the world out there in case these guys have questions? Yes, uh, by all means. I'll, I'll speak with anybody. Yeah, I'll give them my phone number if they want. No, uh, that's not, no you don't want to do that. Not, not, on, not on, on here, but yeah, if yeah. they email the person want to talk. Yeah. Uh, but uh, my email is Damon, D A M O N, 32700 at gmail.com. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, that'd be cool. I appreciate you sharing that. It'll go out there and, and uh, you know, we need more guys like you that are willing to get on and share uh, their, their adventures. It sounds like you've, you've, uh, you're, you're on, uh, you're living the dream, dude. Very much. Yeah, how how you like in Texas? Uh, love it. Um, yeah. Wife and I had our, had actually been talking about moving over here since about Lord uh, 2012, maybe. Uh huh. Uh, well, I just still had a bunch of family left in Louisiana and didn't really want to get away from them. Yeah. So soon after coming home, uh, so we we didn't. We just kept putting it off, and then. When my mother passed away, that was it. It was time. Yeah. And that was 2013, and we moved over. We ended up moving in 19. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome, man. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Damon. I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually, before we go, uh, any final parting words for the, the next generation out there? Just parting words? Uh, just uh, give it your all. Yeah, uh, you you can try and fail. That's perfectly okay. It's not trying that's the bad thing that gets you in trouble. So that is it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I very much look forward to continuing to connect with you. Please don't hesitate to send me messages on LinkedIn. I'm on there all the time. Or you can reach out to me uh, on my email. I'm at mking at processchilleracademy.com. And until next week... Uh, when I give you the next installment, I uh, wish you a great week, and I will connect up with you again soon. Take care now. Bye-bye.